same old pamphlet says you can't think seriously about thinking without thinking about thinking about something. For example, thinking about Go. Let's do that. Reinforcement learning is a sufficient solution to the intelligence question. If you had infinite compute time and memory required for general intelligence, why does Go so hard for computers to play? And there are two main challenges, one I've already alluded to, which is that the search space is really enormous. So just to give you another example of that is in Go, on average, there are around 200 possible moves. In chess, in an average position, there are around 20 moves. So Go has an order of magnitude bigger branching factor than chess has. But actually, harder than the sheer amount of possibilities is um, that until AlphaGo came along, it was thought to be impossible to directly write what's called an evaluation function to tell the system whether black or white was winning and by how much. Now, all of that is impossible in Go. You don't have uh, all the pieces of the same. Um, they, they, you know, the, the idea is that uh, even a small change in the position of one piece can totally change uh, the outlook of the position. Um, so they have huge influence, each of these pieces exactly where they are. But perhaps the hardest thing is that in chess is what I would call a destructive game in the sense that you start with all the pieces on the board and the game gets simpler as you take pieces off. Go is a constructive game in the sense that the board starts empty and you start filling it up. So if you're going to judge a complicated middle game position in chess, you can just look at the current situation that tells you everything about that position. In Go, in a middle game position, you actually have to project into the future what might happen in order to evaluate the current situation. So it's much, much harder to understand uh, uh, whether you're, you're winning or not in a complex mid game position. Just can't get to that understanding by throwing a complicated machine at them. Uh, but if you try to do that, you are led to a conception of success, which is self-reinforcing. And uh, no program until AlphaGo came along. So after 20 years of research, very active research in, in Asia and other places, uh, had, got to, had beaten a professional um, at all, let alone anyone close to uh, world champion standard. Of course, you do get successes in terms of this conception, but is uh, very different from what's done in the sciences. So for example, to take an extreme case, uh, suppose that uh, somebody says he, he, wanna, he wants to eliminate the physics department and do it the right way. The right way is to take endless numbers of videotapes of what's happening outside the window and feed them into the biggest and fastest computer you have, you know, gigabytes of data, and do complex statistical analysis uh, you know, Bayesian, this and that, and, uh, and you, you'll get some kind of prediction about what's going to happen outside the window next. In fact, you get a much better prediction than the physics department will ever give. Well, if success is defined as getting a fair approximation to a mass of chaotic, unanalyzed data, then it's way better to do it this way than to do it the way the physicists do. You know, no thought experiments about the frictionless planes and so on and so forth. But uh, you won't get fundamental, you won't get the kind of understanding that the sciences have always been aimed at. What you'll get is approximation to what's happening. We think about intelligence within the framework of what's called reinforcement learning. And I'm just going to quickly explain what reinforcement learning is. I'm sure many of you will be familiar with it, but for those of you who aren't. So you can think of, first of all, on the left-hand side here, um, the agent or the system. So we, uh, internally at DeepMind, we call our AI systems agents. And uh, this agent finds itself in some kind of environment that it's trying to achieve a goal in. Now, that environment could be the real world, in which case the agent would be a robot, um, or it could be a virtual environment like a game, in which case the agent would be an avatar. Now, the agent only interacts with uh, the environment in two ways. Firstly, it gets observations and rewards through its sensory apparatus. Now, mostly we use vision, um, but you could use other modalities like audition and touch. And in fact, we're expanding to multi-modalities right now. What's that delicious smell? Cookies!
Mm. Stop that sniffing. It's not for you. They're making the house next door smell like cookies so people will subconsciously want to buy it. Oh, come on. What kind of big fat moron would fall for... Th and based on these observations, which are coming in real time, they're incomplete, they're noisy, they're coming through uh, the agent's sensors. Uh, the agents, one of the jobs of the agent is to build the best statistical model it can, most accurate statistical model it can of the environment out there based on these noisy, incomplete observations. And then once it has that model, the second job of the system is to select which is the best action from the set of actions available to it at that moment that will best get it towards its goal. Cookies! So delicious. Must buy house. Oh my no! Marge, get loan pre-approved. Offer over asking. Wave inspections. Two-day escrow. Initial the rate on disclosure and done. Sorry, someone else has bought the house. But my loan has already been sold in pieces to banks, hedge funds, and municipalities across the globe. And this may, this may involve imagination and planning into the future and trying hypothesis testing and all sorts of quite exotic action planning techniques. Now, this agent uh, is usually embedded in a real-time uh, situation or scenario. So when it runs out of time to make these plans, it has to execute uh, an output, uh, the best action it's found so far. That action gets executed. It may or may not drive a change in the environment, and then that drives a new observation. Um, and then the agent will update its model in real time in response to what has just happened. So in essence, this is the whole uh, architecture of reinforcement learning. And uh, you know, although this diagram is very simple, um, this actually hides huge technical complexities and research challenges behind this. But we know that if we could solve all those challenges behind this diagram, that would be enough for general intelligence. A very different approach, is the, which I think is the right approach, is uh, uh, to look for, the, to try to see if you can understand what the fundamental principles are that deal with the core properties and recognize that there's going to be lots of, in the actual usage, there's going to be a thousand other variables intervening, kind of like you know, what's happening outside the window. Uh, and you'll sort of tack those on later on if you want better approximations. That's a different approach. And, it's the, and these are just two different concepts of science. The second one is the one that has been, the, what science has been since, say, Galileo. That's modern science. Uh, the, uh, uh, the approximating unanalyzed data kind is a sort of a new approach. Uh, not totally, you know, there's things like that in the past, but it's basically a, an, a new approach which is, have been accelerated by the existence of massive memories, very rapid processing, uh, which enables you to do things like this you couldn't have done by hand. You know? But I think uh, myself that it is leading, it tends to lead the subject like computational cognitive science into a direction of uh, maybe some practical applicability. but away from understanding. It actually created what seemed to be new ideas. And I just want to take you through one of those ideas to try and convince you, if I can, um, that, 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 that these were truly sort of original thoughts, uh, uh, ideas that AlphaGo was coming up with. So here's a position from game two uh, and move 37, which is my favorite move from the whole uh, series of matches. And I think we'll go down in Go history. And uh, in this position, uh, AlphaGo is playing black and Lisa Doll is playing white. And AlphaGo played this move on the right-hand side here, middle of the right-hand side of the board uh, that I've indicated here with the white triangle. That was move 37. Now, that move's called a shoulder hit because you're diagonally next to an opponent's stone. Now, um, to explain why that is such an astounding move for all the professionals in the room, all the commentators, that we had rooms filled of Korean commentators and, and English language commentators, and they were all shocked by this. And the reason is, is because there are two important lines in Go. So it's a 19 by 19 board, but there are two critical lines uh, in tradition. The third line here, that I've marked with the line here. Now, if you play on the third line, what you're saying to your opponent is, I'm going to take territory to the side of the board. I'm going to wall off territory to the side of the board, and I'm going to bank those points. Instead of that, so here's the side of the board. That's what you're doing when you play on the third line. If you play on the fourth line instead, what you're saying to your opponent is, I'm actually going to take power and influence into the center of the board. 
And the idea behind playing on the fourth line is that later on, that power and influence will get you territory somewhere else on the board that will be equal to the territory you gave up locally on the third line. Right? So for 3,000 years, the received wisdom has been that playing on the third line and your opponent playing on the fourth line is an equal trade or vice versa, right? So basically, generally speaking, if you do that, you're, you've got an equal trade and things should proceed as normal. But what you'll notice is, is that AlphaGo played on the fifth line, right? So it played on the fifth line, one line higher up, to take power and influence into the center of the board. And the fifth line is obviously giving away, you know, you're sort of selling your opponent, you can take territory from the fourth line. So you're giving away a whole extra line of territory towards the side of the board, which is huge in Go. Right? So what, it is, what we think this means is that um, for 3,000 years, humans may have been underestimating the value of power and influence to the center of the board, despite 3,000 years of sort of professional you know, contemplation and play, which is kind of incredible if you think about that. So, um, and obviously, the interesting thing is, so Go is like art, right? That's how it's considered. In fact, if you, if you talk to top Go players, they'll tell you it's, it embodies all the complexities of the universe. That's how they, they, they think of it. But it's interesting because it's objective art. So, you know, or any one of us in this room could come up with a, 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 an original move by playing something random, right? But it wouldn't mean it was any good, right? It might be original, but it wouldn't mean it was any good. So the key thing about this move is, is that it turned out to be pivotal, pivotal to winning the game. And what happened was, is that these two stones here in the bottom left of the uh, hand side that are surrounded by the white stones and seem to be in trouble, that I've, I've indicated with the white triangles there. 50 moves later, around 50 moves later, the fighting from the bottom left-hand corner spilled out into the center of the board and went all the way to the right-hand side of the board. And that move 37 stone happened to be in the perfect place to decide that running fight, right? So it's as if somehow AlphaGo had been presiant about what was going to happen and then sort of positioned this, this piece in exactly the right place to, to decide, that, decide you know, that decisive battle over on the left-hand side. So I've told you that this is a, you know, a wonderfully creative move and the professionals were astounded. So, um, so that was pretty revolutionary and there were lots of examples of that during the game. Um, and then I must mention Lisa Dole's incredible genius too. So, and, uh, and he did this incredible move himself, move 78 in game four, which I haven't got time, I'm not going to go through. But um, this incredible move in the center of the board, this wedge move, which will, I think will also go down in Go history. And what happened is, is that it actually confused AlphaGo into misevaluating the whole position. So it confused that value net, that pink network I showed earlier on, uh, to misevaluate what was going on here. And uh, the interesting thing about this was is that uh, after the match, so actually, some of the Chinese commentators who were watching this, they called it a god move. Uh, so, so, so in the sense of it was divinely inspired. And this just shows you how much sort of, sort of spiritual philosophy there is in Go, in the sense of um, pe people spend their whole careers, the top players, trying to play what's called a divine move in one, once in their lives, which means a move so beautiful and so kind of ununderstandable that it must have been inspired by God. So this is maybe Lisa Dole's move of that. And the thing was is that AlphaGo knew this was a very unusual move because we looked in the log files, obviously, straight after this match to see what happened. And we asked AlphaGo its probability of uh, it, it, what it thought the probability was of a human, top human player playing that move. And it gave a probability of 0.007%. <laughs> so it knew this was like a 1 in 10,000 uh, chance move from a, from a top, top player. So, so somehow, and, and, and obviously this is, this is interesting too, because it explains why AlphaGo had, had not seen that kind of move before, because AlphaGo would not have played that move, right? So, so somehow, um, so how would it have ever explored that during self-play, which is quite interesting. And obviously the only way to overcome that is to have Lisa Doll in your testing room 24-7, which we don't have, right? So uh, none of us are good enough at Go, or, you know, very few, there's hardly anyone else in the world who would be good enough to be able to live with AlphaGo for that long in order to be able to play this incredibly masterful move themselves. So, um, so, so you know, it's very interesting that AlphaGo kind of knew this was super unusual and it kind of threw out its search during those two minutes and sort of had to recap calculate everything um, from, the, from scratch during that move. Now, uh, I mentioned about the impact of the match, you know, 280 million viewers, 35,000 press articles. Also, the thing I'm most proud of is that Go boards were sold out online for two months in the West. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I've, I've heard of whole new clubs at MIT and elsewhere, like sort of, you know, order of magnitude, more people joining those clubs, which is great to see. Now, um, I've talked a lot about intuition and creativity, and I just wanted to, you know, they're quite 
loosely defined words in science. So I wanted to just talk a little bit uh, about how I operationally think about them. I'm not saying this encompasses all of intuition and creativity. I just think it's an interesting way to think about it. So intuition, you could regard, I think, as implicit knowledge that's been acquired through experience, but you can't consciously access or express, right? I think that's, that's really what we're, we call when we say this sort of folk word intuition. I think that's what we mean. Um, now, you know, I ask, well, how do we know uh, that knowledge is there? Well, we can test the existence and the quality of that knowledge. We can verify it behaviorally, right? So obviously, um, in Go, that's very easy. We can give someone a Go position, and we can evaluate the quality of, of the move that they pick. And, and that's done all over the place. Like, uh, you know, suppose you want to predict tomorrow's weather. Mm. Well, one way to do it is uh, a weather complicated system. Uh, one way to do it is to say, okay, I'll, f I'll get my you know, statistical priors, if you like. So there's a high probability that uh, t tomorrow's weather here will be the same as it was yesterday in Cleveland, so I'll stick that in. And uh, the, you know, where the sun is will have some effect, so I'll stick that in. And you get a bunch of assumptions like that. You run the experiment, you look it over and over again, you correct it by Bayesian methods, you get better priors. And, you keep going, you have a pretty good, a pretty good approximation to what uh, tomorrow's weather is going to be. That's not what meteorologists do. Uh, they want to understand how it's working. And these are just two different concepts of what success means, uh, what achievement is. Uh, it, in this, my own field, language studies, it's all over the place. Like computational uh, uh, cognitive science applied to language, uh, the concept of success that's used is virtually always this. So if you get more and more data and better and better statistics, you can get a better and better approximation to some you know, immense right. corpus of texts, like everything in the Wall Street Journal uh, sure. archives. But you learn nothing about the language. And it's quite actually hard to even understand what the aim is at the end, because it's not like in chess where there's a checkmate, it's a very clear objective. In Go, it's actually quite intuitive even to decide when the end has come. 